Rediscover your past by digitizing your family's memories with Legacy Box. Watch until the end of this video to find out more about preserving your legacy, and then visit LegacyBox.com slash recollection. The 1970s and 1980s were special to say the least. Things were done a little differently back then, including our strange taste in earthy colors. During this time, kids were at their most independent and had plenty of time to roam free. So let's take a look at life back in the 1970s and 80s, something kids today will never understand. Options for watching TV were very different during the 1970s. For one, there were really only three TV channels plus public broadcasting. That's right, just three. No streaming services, no endless options. You'd also have to get up and manually turn the dial to change channels. It was a time in which we waited for our favorite shows, which included nightly shows that were popular and Saturday morning cartoons. It was a big deal when you could pour a big bowl of cereal and binge hours of your favorite animated shows. But with the limited options on the television, it's no wonder kids spent so much time outside. Well, that and the fact that some parents made their kids go outside and play. During the 70s, making a mixtape was an art form. It took patience and dedication to sit by the radio for hours, waiting for the right song to be played. It didn't matter how good your timing was either, because pushing down the play and record buttons at precisely the right time still sometimes had the DJ talking over the intro. And that was just part of the charm. Cassettes had their quirks too, like when they got tangled and you would have to use a pencil to wind them back in. Cassettes made it pretty easy to create what we know today as a playlist, and this was the first time we could listen anywhere we wanted. Did you ever run around the house and pretend you were Superman or Batman? Well, if you did during the 1970s, then you most likely had on a pair of superhero underoos. For many kids, they served a dual purpose. They were underwear and part of a costume when you were strutting around the house feeling invincible. Superhero underoos were more than just clothing. They were your identity, especially the ones that match the actual superhero outfits. Nowadays, kids can never appreciate their underwear in the same way. During the 1970s, record stores were not just places to buy music. They were social gathering spots. Just like the mall of the 1980s, young people would hang out with friends, browse through vinyl records, and even listen to albums before they purchased them. Store employees at this time were also music enthusiasts, and they would recommend hidden gems. It also wasn't uncommon for you to strike up a conversation with a stranger who was into the same music as you. So the local record store was a special place, and yet another experience that is hard to replicate today. Hitchhiking during the 1970s was surprisingly easy and acceptable. It was very common to see people thumbing a ride on the side of the road. Drivers would often not hesitate to pick up hitchhikers, and it was seen as a way to help out a fellow traveler. There was more of a sense of camaraderie on the open road back then, and that's hard to understand in today's world. But it wasn't without risk, and there was still a chance you might encounter a few weirdos, and that was just part of the fun. Nowadays, it's illegal to hitch free rides in many places, but back then, it wasn't unusual to find a service member, a student, or even a hippie thumbing for a ride. When you think back to the 1970s, men had some serious style. They had manly mustaches, sideburns, big hair, and that distinct aroma of aftershave wafting around them. It was all about the macho look, and men took their grooming pretty seriously. This was also coupled with some pretty bold choices in clothing too. And as long as you could leave a couple of buttons undone so you could show off your hairy chest, you were good to go. Nothing quite matches the swagger men had in the 1970s. And speaking of grooming, ladies too had their own unique products to give them that 1970s look. Sun-in was all the rage, promising sun-kissed highlights. Women would spray it into their hair and head outside hoping for those perfect golden locks. And who doesn't remember the smell of Love's Baby Soft, a signature scent from the 1970s? The sweet, youthful fragrance was a defining smell that had all the girls wearing Baby Soft. But I'm not sure the ad campaign would fly today. 
when the telephone that hung in the kitchen rang, it was always answered. This was before caller ID, so people had no idea who was calling. Can you imagine? You didn't know if it was your best friend or a sales call, which meant there was a chance that you might recognize the voice on the other end and spend some time getting twisted up in the phone cord while you talked. Or you might be yelling across the house to let someone else know the call was for them. Today's kids might find it unbelievable that we willingly picked up the phone without the slightest clue as to who was on the other end. To best capture the moments in the 1970s, you absolutely needed a Polaroid camera. The idea of hitting the button and instantly getting a picture developed was gratifying, but you had to be selective because each roll of film only had a certain number of pictures. And then there was the practice of shaking the picture to help it develop faster, which was just a myth. But you couldn't take the bulky Polaroid camera with you everywhere, so there were also photo booths that were strategically placed where teenagers congregated. Places like arcades, malls, and roller rinks were ideal, so best friends and couples could capture the day with a series of goofy and fun pictures. If you were to step back in time and visit a 1970s kitchen, you'd probably find a fair share of mushroom-themed decor. Mushroom plates, mushroom curtains, mushroom wallpaper, they were everywhere. Everything back then seemed to have an earthy aesthetic, and mushrooms must have been the perfect fungus to represent that style. I guess you'd call it charm, and every corner of the room seemed to be inspired by it. As you waited for the weekend, and that special morning of cartoons, you also needed a sugary cereal to help you enjoy it. The 1970s was all about finding the best surprise toy inside the cereal box. Kids would beg their parents for a certain brand of cereal, not because of the taste, but because of the toy. It may have been a silly game or a small figurine, but it was like finding a treasure when you dug down to the bottom of the box and pulled out the prize. This excitement made morning cereal more than just breakfast, which is much different than today. Opening a beer or soda can in the 1970s was a bit different than what we are used to today. You'd pull the ring back and peel back the aluminum tab. And back then, most of the tabs were just tossed on the ground. These sharp pieces of discarded metal were a nuisance, especially on beaches or places where you might walk barefoot. These pull tabs were just another hazard that we faced, and the tops would change shortly after to the more familiar stay tab that we recognize today. But it was still all part of the fun of living in the 1970s. Last but not least, school lunch in the 1970s wasn't complete without a trusty metal lunchbox and the matching thermos. These lunchboxes not only showed off our favorite characters from pop culture, but they often also had their fair share of rust on them too. Any ding or scratch would quickly rust over, and our parents didn't seem to mind either. Remember the smell of opening a metal lunchbox after a long, hot day? Kids today, with their ice packs and insulated lunch bags, will never fully understand what it was like to grow up in the 1970s. At Recollection Road, I believe preserving the past is incredibly important, and our friends at Legacy Box do too. So much so, they've offered my viewers a code for 55% off. In today's digital age, analog media like VHS tapes and film reels are fading, risking the loss of cherished memories due to things like mold, dust, and time. But Legacy Box, trusted by over 1.5 million families, offers a simple and safe solution to protect your memories before it's too late. With Legacy Box, you can convert your analog treasures into digital memories effortlessly. Send your VHS tapes, camcorder tapes, and pictures to Legacy Box, and like magic, receive back your originals and digital copies for easy enjoyment, sharing, and organization. And here's the kicker. For a limited time, enjoy an exclusive 55% discount at LegacyBox.com slash recollection. Don't let your memories fade. Preserve your past today with Legacy Box. Buy today to take advantage of this exclusive offer and send them in whenever you're ready. Go to LegacyBox.com slash recollection to save 55% while supplies last. 
The use of technology in schools varies greatly when we think back to the 1980s. They of course had overhead projectors, which allowed the teacher to project transparent sheets onto a screen, which allowed them to work through problems or worksheets as a whole class, essentially replacing the need for a blackboard. But when we think of classroom technology today, kids have iPads and laptops that they carry around with them all the time. Back in the 1980s, you were lucky if there was one giant computer somewhere in the classroom, or a special computer room you would go to that was used by the whole school. The days you could play on the computer was always a treat because it meant you could play the Oregon Trail. For some, this was the first memory of using a computer, and it certainly was memorable, especially since you were usually killed off before you made it to Oregon. Kids today have access to more entertainment than they could ever dream of consuming. When new movies come out, you can stream them instantly, and you don't even have to beg your parents. In the 1980s, the closest thing to on-demand was waiting all week to head to the video store. This was after you waited months for the movie to be released on VHS. Then when you would head over to the new release section at your local video store, there's a good chance all the copies were already rented, and you had to wait even longer. There was still nothing better than making that weekly trip to rent movies and leaving with a stack of VHS tapes that would fill your weekend. Oh yeah, and you also had to remember to rewind the movies before you return them to the store. Within the last few years, the need for fidget toys has become almost a necessity for kids, as if sitting still for a bit is torture. Kids today have to constantly be fiddling, spinning, or clicking buttons in order to survive the day. The closest thing we had to a fidget spinner was the Rubik's Cube. This puzzle game had you twisting blocks in order to complete each side's color. It required thought and strategy to even come close, but there was also a book you could buy which helped you learn how to solve the puzzle. Aside from the Rubik's Cube, there were also these helicopter seeds that would fall from the trees. I guess picking them up, tossing them in the air, and watching them twirl back down to earth over and over again could be considered fidgeting back in the day. Whenever a disaster strikes today, you seem to always see a GoFundMe page or some other crowdfunding app that is meant to ease the financial burden. But in the 1980s, music was how we raised money for the needy. Songs like Do They Know It's Christmas and We Are The World gathered the decade's biggest stars to perform a charity single that raised money to combat the famine happening in Ethiopia. On top of that, there were also opportunities through television commercials to sponsor children in impoverished countries. For just $11 a month, you believed you were making a difference in the world. The fantasy genre in the 1980s was drastically different than what we see today. With CGI and advances in special effects, franchises like Harry Potter, Avatar, and Game of Thrones look unbelievably real. Maybe that's why cosplay is so popular, even for adults. But in the 1980s, you never saw anyone walking around as their favorite character from The Dark Crystal or The NeverEnding Story. These movies used puppets and animatronics that were pretty crude, so you never truly felt immersed in that world. There was Star Wars, which was the most convincing, but it's really nothing like the newer Star Wars films developed today. Instead, we had David Bowie, basically dressed as a 1970s version of himself in the 1986 movie Labyrinth. The 1980s was a revolution in video games being brought to the masses. This is the decade when kids moved away from heading to the arcade and chose to stay home and play their very own Atari, Commodore 64, or Nintendo Entertainment System. It was exhilarating when you opened up that birthday or Christmas present and saw a Nintendo logo, and kids today may never know that feeling. However, video games were large cartridges, and they occasionally needed special treatment before they could be played. Nintendo games like Duck Hunt and The Legend of Zelda may have needed the dust blown out before you could get it to load. If that didn't work, you might also have to try inserting the cartridge in different ways to get it to start. Today, games live online, and video game consoles are just computers that connect to the internet, and they give you instant access to any game you want to play. Oh yeah, and the controllers are wireless now, so you don't have to sit within six feet of the television to play a game. During the 1980s, rainbows were not a statement about your sexuality. 
it was just a colorful way to accessorize an outfit. Who didn't wear the standard 1980s flip-flops with rainbow straps? There were also the occasional set of suspenders or a belt that added a pop of color to any toddler outfit. We also had Punky Brewster, Rainbow Bright, and even Reading Rainbow, which pretty much every kid in the 1980s grew up watching. Today, the world of music is large, and kids have endless options when it comes to finding their favorite musician, from rap to country, Disney Channel pop stars to YouTubers. But in the 1980s, there were really just two megastars in the world of music, Michael Jackson and Madonna. For Michael Jackson, it was his Thriller album from 1982, which became the best-selling album of all time. For Madonna, it was her Like a Virgin album in 1984, which had just enough bad girl edge to it that teenagers went crazy for it. Both artists built careers off the success they had in the 1980s, and they remain icons to this day. The fast food experience in the 1980s was all about the promotions. I mean, who didn't have a set of Smurf glasses in their kitchen cupboard? Not only was the food affordable back then, but you got a ton of free stuff too. From 3D glasses and toys to California raisins and Muppet Babies, McDonald's, Burger King, and Hardee's were always offering up the coolest promo to get you in the door. Even Pizza Hut had promotional drinkware with the release of E.T. in 1982. And who could forget the Noid figures you could pick up at Domino's in the 1980s? Today, the influence that movies and pop culture have on fast food choices is pretty non-existent. And on top of that, inflation is about the only thing on the menu these days. Just like with movies and video games, streaming services give viewers control when it comes to watching their favorite show. But during the 80s, TV shows were a weekly event that aired on a specific channel at a specific time. So if you missed it, you were out of luck. That's why it was so important to consult the TV guide or the listings available in the newspaper if you wanted to watch something. Most people had a favorite night for watching TV, and that led to networks blocking their most popular shows into one night. NBC's Must See TV, although it wouldn't be called that until the 1990s, was Thursday nights, anchored by The Cosby Show. And TGIF became ABC's Big Friday Night, with shows like Full House and Perfect Strangers. If you didn't have a VCR set to record your favorite shows, then you were at the mercy of catching reruns, which might mean months of waiting. Making phone calls just like writing letters was how we communicated with people during the 1980s. This was before texting, FaceTime, and smartphones. There were three types of calls you could make. A local call, which you would make to friends. A long distance expensive call, which you waited until after 7 p.m. to make because it was cheaper. And then the collect call, when you wanted the other party to pay for it. The collect call meant dialing the operator first to provide the phone number and your name. They would then call the other person and see if they would accept the charges before they would connect the call. Phone bills were a big part of the 1980s, and it was easy to rack up a huge bill if you weren't careful. Today, we don't even think about phone charges, except when we are adding new lines to our family plan. One of the overarching themes of the 1980s was saying no to drugs. The Just Say No campaign was spearheaded by First Lady Nancy Reagan and was promoted through public events, public service announcements, and even incorporated into TV programming like Different Strokes and Punky Brewster. There was also the D.A.R.E. program, which had popular shirts that read D.A.R.E. to keep kids off drugs. These programs targeted street drugs in the 1980s, but if they were relaunched today, they would most certainly be aimed at prescription prescription drugs and the pharmaceutical companies that run non-stop ads on just about every platform. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything, and make sure to check the description of this video for links to pick up a t-shirt and sign up for the newsletter. Thank you to our loyal Patreon supporters listed here. Visit patreon.com slash recollectionroad to join the club. As always, thank you so much for watching.